The Bible tells us that man could freely consume fruit from anywhere on the earth, and that animals could freely eat from any plant that grew on earth. These were the exact parameters of the diet of finished creation. Man is to eat fruit and herbs that can reproduce by seeds, such as berries, melon, fruits, squashes, etc. The Hebrew words represented are zira, meaning seed, and piri, meaning fruit. God gave us what would be the healthiest for us because it is what we were designed to eat and He created us. Does diet affect salvation? No, not whatsoever. However, ask yourself though, how does deviating from the original plan help anyone? How can we glorify God if we ourselves are sick, unhealthy, or dying? Is there any proof of early man eating this way? Or any proof that we were actually designed to be this way? Oh yes, anatomical observation and comparative anatomy studies prove this as well. Omnivores, for example, can consume both meat and vegetables raw very easily, where both are harmful and hard to digest for humans in their natural form. Both require some form of processing or cooking. All omnivores have sharp fangs and bladed, shaped crushing molars. Omnivores swallow their food after a short, simple crushing. Omnivores have low jaws, which are always embedded inside of the top. Omnivores have no lateral or forward jaw mobility. Omnivores' saliva is acidic, with no pitolin. Omnivores' renal secretion of uricase. Omnivores secrete acid urine. Omnivores all have strong hydrochloric acid in their stomachs. Omnivores require no fiber for peristalsis. Omnivores' facial muscles are very minimal and allow a wide mouth for a gap for food. Omnivores are able to maximize and metabolize large amounts of vitamin A and cholesterol without a problem. Humans have major problems with both. Omnivores are fueled by fat and protein. Humans are carbohydrate based. Omnivores intestines are always three times the length of their body. Omnivores all have short colons with smooth and alkaline by nature. Omnivores jaws are angled and not expanded. Complete digestion is within six to ten hours. Omnivores examples are hogs, brown bears, raccoons, primates. Omnivores are everything eaters who thrive on all raw foods from leaves and trees and stems to ground roots natural surroundings, ants, and even each other if needs be. A frugivore, on the other hand, has complete digestion in about 12 to 18 hours with a long intestinal sacculated colon. They can only metabolize small amounts of vitamin A and require no cholesterol whatsoever. They require fiber for peristalsis. They all have alkaline urine with weak hydrochloric acid. Fruitarians do not secrete uricose. Fruitarians have alkaline saliva and pitolin. Fruitarians have big salivatory glands. Fruitarians' upper jaws sit on the bottom and have great lateral and forward mobility. Fruitarians chew their food, not just crush it. Fruitarians have flattened big molars, big flattened incisors, blunt canines. Fruitarians see in full color and are fueled by glycogen and vitamin C is required. Fruitarian jaw angle is expanded with extensive chewing required and highly developed facial muscles to facilitate this chewing. Fruitarians consist of several types of species, like bats, the owl monkeys, humans, a number of flying foxes, and many passerine birds, toucans, and some species of parrots. Now consider this as well. Human cells have receptors for malic acid, citric acid, ascorbic acid, ascorbyl palmitate, and polyphenols. These are all elements found only in fruits and their requirements, yet nothing in the human body requires anything from an animal source. Think about it. If it was a baby, they would need meat to survive, yet this is not the case. That is actually disastrous for a child as where we absolutely require vitamin C and absolutely require fiber and weak organic acids from fruit. Meat is a class one carcinogen worldwide. Meat cures no known disease of any kind, only causes it. Only plants can cure people. If you think about it, by all means, name a medicinal chicken or a cow. I'll wait. Another way to tell if a species is fruitarian is to map the area of absorptive mucosa in the gut. 
versus functional body size. Even in 1971, a study done by B.J. Myers was published in the South African Medical Journal, describing how lipid profiles and glucose tolerance improved on a particular fruitarian diet. In a further trial in the study, body weight and overweight subjects were showed a tendency to level off at the theoretical ideal weight. Humans are frugivores by design, but when we look at the ability to eat other food groups, like an omnivore, through the process of cooking skills, then it's possible. Without cooking, we are not able to survive as a raw omnivore. If you think you can, by all means, please go outside, pull some leaves off trees, catch an animal wild, raw, and eat them up, pull some grass out of the ground that you're walking on, and feast. See some wild lake grooms growing? No problem. Pull those suckers off and eat them. You'll be dead in no time. You are not an omnivore. You are a frugivore. Just like God designed us to be. I have been one since 2002. And no, I do not supplement. Evolutionists actually believe in the same thing we Christians do in this regard, even if they don't know it or not, that early man was a frugivore. Because think about it, either man was placed in a garden created for the fruit of the trees like the Bible says, or man evolved. Well, if man evolved, what did he do before he invented fire? That's right, he ate it raw. Raw fruit. It's obvious, because you can't run around eating raw meat. You would die, you'd be parasitic ridden in no time. Animals in the Bible were all started out as plant eaters, it tells us. So what happens when you put a shark or a bear or a lion on a plant diet? They can thrive. That's right, all obligate carnivores can live off of plants, even to this day. Sharks and spiders and snakes and buzzards and piranhas and dolphins and wolves, lions, panthers, house cats, alligators, crocodiles, Komodo dragons have all been witnessed and documented doing just that. During World War II, when meat was rare in Europe, they were feeding the zoo animals in London vegetables because that's all that they had. They all lived on cabbage. Now, let's get into what confuses Christians and why they believe that meat is just fine and totally okay to eat. Remember, I'm not talking about salvational. We know that no diet is, will save or condemn anyone. I'm, not, I'm only talking about health. The Bible is trying to tell us in 1 Timothy verse 4 that anyone who teaches that you must give up meat to be saved is a doctrine of devils. It is not telling you that if you desire to give up meat, you are following a doctrine of devils. That wouldn't make any sense at all, especially since the apostles became vegetarian. Even the Messiah himself was even stated in Isaiah 7.15, a prophecy about the coming Messiah, that they would know him by this, by being a vegetarian. Let's look a bit closer now, shall we? If you look at 1 Timothy 4.3, the word meat is not actually written in the original Greek manuscript. Your King James Version says meat because they translated bromaten to mean meat rather than food, which it actually means. The word for meat is kria. You can find it in Romans 14.21. Look for yourself at every other Bible translation there is. Only King James got it wrong. It's funny to me that readers think Paul is not only condoning meat, but saying it's better for faith, when literally he himself commanded us to abstain from eating meat earlier in the Bible in the book of Acts, 1520, 1529, and 2125. These verses Paul is forbidding you to eat meat. Does it mean he himself is teaching the doctrine of demons? Obviously no. The verse in 1 Timothy 4.3 is about fasting from food. Later, Paul states in Romans 14.21, It is best to abstain from eating any meat, or drinking any wine, or from any other activity which might cause your brother to fall away. So it's obvious 1 Timothy had nothing to do with eating meat. I think this mistranslation happened during the early Bible formation era, when many still didn't think Jesus was the Messiah, nor liked him, and wanted to slander him being this prophet. So if they could prove that he was eating meat, then they could prove that he was not the prophesized one. Because if Jesus didn't follow the prophecy, then he was a false prophet, and the Jews did not accept him specifically concerning prophecy. What about the argument, but we are, have dominion over the animals, that they must have been given us to eat? That is wrong. The word kabbas and rada are translated into English as subdual and to rule in Genesis 128. It is referring to animals being used purely as servitude until the day of Noah's flood. Work and labor were their service to man. Our dominion over them was to submit to our service. 
I can prove this in Hebrew with the term rada, which means to rule, is often used in the Old Testament in context as to rule associated with kingship or dominion. The use of the word kabas means to subdue. Acts 15.20 tells us that Christians to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexually immoral acts, and from meat, from strangled animals, and from blood. Most of the confusion comes from Paul in Romans. Two verses in particular stand out. One who is weak in faith eats only vegetables. And the other one says, Now accept one who is weak in faith, but do not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. So let's look closer at these, shall we? It is important to our understanding on chapter 14 to be absolutely clear to the issue at hand. The issue to which Paul speaks on is the matter of personal convictions about doubtful disputations. Individual Christians should not differ over matters of conscience, ethics, or liberties. The differences of which Paul speaks on are not over absolutes or fundamental doctrines of faith. Specifically, Paul mentions the matter of eating meat or only vegetables in verse 2, and observing of certain holy days, verse 5, and of drinking wine, verse 21. He starts with the example of diet. Some of his readers are vegetarian, others are not. The two groups should not be critical of each other, but they are. So Paul criticizes them. Since they all serve the same master, who are you, Paul asks, to judge the servant of another? So in conclusion, while the two Christians may disagree over whether or not a Christian should drink wine, celebrate feast days, or eat only vegetables, it is irrelevant to Paul because it is not a salvational topic. What he is trying to convey is that no Christian should dispute the fact that lying, stealing, murder, and adultery are sinful. These are biblical and moral absolutes. It is summed up in Romans 14.3. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them both. Now let's take a step back for a moment and see if there is validity in my statement that we were all designed to eat a certain way by God, by comparing life expectancies worldwide, shall we? The shortest living people on earth are the highest meat eating cultures. The Eskimos, which the Paleo people of today love to tout as their great examples of what Paleo diet can do, are a joke. The actual life of the Eskimos born between 1902 and 1922 averaged 49 years of age, with the oldest living one on record making it to the age of 79. My war vet grandfather, who had a non-working arm for 15 years and died from asbestos on his lungs working at a refinery for over 40 years, who smoked for 35 years of his life and ate McDonald's apple pies for pretty much every day of his last years of his life, even he lived longer. Hell, I didn't even bother mentioning that the Eskimos had horrible bone, heart, and other health problems. So if the plant diet wasn't superior, then the more meat you remove, the sicker you would become. Let's see if that's true. Before the HIV and AIDS epidemic hit, groups of missionaries went out in rural Africa in the early 20th century and found that many tribes, including the Maasai, had no coronary heart disease, strokes, cancer, blood pressure, diabetes, canker sores, and most other diseases were totally absent. Yet even though the Maasai were absent in most disease and consumed nothing but grass-fed, free-range, organic, wild-caught meat, they are and were among the shortest living people on the planet. Their life expectancy was 42 for men and 44 for women. The highest meat-eating society on earth are in Africa, Alaska, and Russia. Their life expectancy today is around 61 to 67 years on average. The highest vegetarian countries on earth range from 68 to 83 years of age. India at 68 being the lowest because they have their high poverty rate, which is Israel the next at 82 years, Taiwan at 80 years, Italy at 82. As you can see, even the majority wins. Considering India is one of the poorest countries on earth, it is still higher on life expectancy than even the best ranked high meat eating countries. The highest dairy consuming countries are Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. And if you notice, there is no coincidence that the highest rate of bone degenerative diseases also arise there. Hip fractures are far more common in countries that consume high amounts of dairy as well. Their meat actually comes from fish, not so much chicken or beef, 
and it only consists of 20% of their total diet. Not that high overall. It's dairy that's their problem. Almost half, 44% of the saturated fat in the average diet comes from milk fats. Denmark is nowhere near the consumption of the US when it comes to meat. Americans eat about 200 pounds of meat per capita annually, which is more than double the global average. Over 8% of Danes actually don't even eat meat. Now let's take a look at the highest plant-eating societies on Earth. The longest living culture and group of people on Earth are the Seventh-day Adventist vegetarians and vegans. Second place is Okinawa, where a local village has an average age of 88 years. They were not fish eaters like people think they were either. They were sweet potato eaters, with 70% of their calories coming from sweet potatoes and less than 1% of their total calories came from fish, which equaled half an ounce a day. No other meat. This is why they made the blue zones. Chinese centurions come in third place. They consume sweet potatoes as well. Up to 55% of their calories come from sweet potatoes, as where only 1% of their calories come from meats in the diet. So as you can see, there is a huge correlation between the amount of meat that's removed from the diet and the longer you're going to live. In an amazing study done by Walter Kempner in his book called The Rice Diet, he removed groups of hundreds of people, both male and female, from all dairy, eggs, and meat products and give them a protein deficiency. That was his goal. The study was done using only white rice. And after three weeks, humans had no low protein. So basic white table sugar was added to cut its protein in half. After another three weeks, not a single person on the study had even a single low protein issue. So imagine how little protein we actually require. Then in the study, something crazy, an amazing breakthrough happened by accident in 1942, when one of Dr. Kipner's patients, a 33-year-old Northern Carolina woman with chronic kidney disease and eye disease, failed to follow the instructions. Because of the Dr. Kipner's heavy German accent, she misunderstood his instructions to return in two weeks, and she actually returned after two months. With no signs of deficiency, she was actually in robust health. The woman had experienced a dramatic reduction in blood pressure, all of the damage from her eyes was better, and the noticeable difference in heart size was documented. Dr. Waltner was a pioneer in his use of this diet treatment to treat chronic diseases, utilizing a diet of mostly rice with fruit to cure malignant hypertension, reverse heart disease, and kidney failure. I would like to reiterate, though your salvation is not dependent on a, such a thing like these diet changes that I'm recommending, you cannot glorify God if you yourself are sick, weak, or disease ridden. By a misuse of any of these powers that God gave us, we rob God in the honor that's due to Him. Everything that enfeebles us physically or enfeebles our mind, why would God want this for you? A failure to care about the living machinery is an insult to the Creator. This is why he gave us this body and we call it a temple because we are supposed to cherish it. This is why gluttony is a sin and is harmful to yourself. God thinks that pigs are an abomination and wishes that we should not eat it. And this is forever. Deuteronomy 14.3 says you shall not eat an abomination. Why? Why would it say this if this was not harmful to us? And God is unchanging, right? If he considers it an abomination to him, what did he change his mind on this later? I don't think so. So many excuses are made today, even biblically, like, well, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that makes him unclean, but it's what's come out. That's wrong. It's entirely wrong. That's what, that was talking about unwashed hands, and the Pharisees were trying to catch the Messiah slipping. Another excuse is the concept, well, Jesus ate fish. I'll get to that one in a minute. But remember, the laws of nature are among the many laws of God which were set in. Since one is the law of nature are based on biology and design, it is plainly our duty to follow what we were designed to do. Another law God gave man is that we reap what we sow. You sow trash into your body, then you're going to reap disease and sickness. Ignoring what we were designed for leads to health problems. This is why we should study nature's requirements in regards to our own health and our biology needs and conform to them. God's law are written upon every nerve, muscle, and cell of mankind. We were made in the image of God. Why would he want you to destroy this vessel which he has given you only one of, and health that he has given us as a gift? I believe that every careless, inattentive action and abuse put on the body's wonderful mechanism by disregarding God's specified laws is a violation of God's law. 
God gave us dietary law in the beginning because it was good for us, not for any other reason. Every law that God gives to mankind is for our benefit, not for His. Luke 24, 41-43 is the only place in the entire Bible where it specifically says that Jesus ate meat. It says that He ate boiled fish. But there is a very simple explanation for this. It's a forgery. Many other scriptures elsewhere in the Bible actually point to Jesus after the resurrection going to Galilee, such as Matthew 26:32, Mark 14:28, Matthew 28:10, Mark 16:7, and Matthew 28:7. Not traveling to the inn in the city of Aramaeus where the fish eating supposedly took place. We know that he could not have eaten meat because it would have proven prophecy wrong. So that debunks that argument alone. Daniel knew the power of foods. It's why that he told the king in Daniel 1.8 that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. Rather, he said, give me vegetables and water. His intelligence increased. Is there any validity to this? Yes. Vegetarian IQ in adults and kids are both higher. Since the smartest people on earth have also been vegetarians, then it makes sense. Einstein, Tesla, Isaac Newton, Pythagoras, Plato, Da Vinci, Voltaire. So observation shows that plants are better for IQ. Even the most recent study on vegans show that average to 10 points higher in both male and female. When animal studies are conducted, even on primates, it's the fruit eating studies that actually show the bigger brain growth, not meat. A lot of people today think that no civilization has ever existed that has lived as a vegetarian or a vegan in the past, so therefore we should not attempt to do so now. Here's why that is wrong. First, we have ancient Roman writings from 700 BC of a group of vegans who also avoided legumes because they had the shape of fetuses. Over half of the Indian cultures are, are vegetarian and uh, because of Hinduism, one of the largest religions in the world, and it's one of the oldest religions on the planet. Buddhism is almost all vegan besides some dairy products that a lot of them that live on mountains and things just don't even have access to. They'll do honey, but the origin of veganism incorporated honey. That's only a new thing. Uh, Muslim advocates vegetarianism and still practice it today. So as you can see, no ancient culture as being vegetarian or vegan is unfounded. But veganism goes back even further. We have both Homer, written in the Odyssey, and Herodotus, who mention the Lothavigi people. They are lotus eaters, an indigenous people of northern African coast who, according to Herodotus, lived on nothing but the fruits of a plant called lotus. Another piece of evidence that comes to my mind is when the History Channel had an episode of the Gladiators on, from ancient Rome. They ended up proving that the Gladiators were vegetarians. Because when they buried a gladiator, they were respected really well, and their, their tombs were distinct. They were buried almost like royalty. They crossed their legs to show that they died in battle, and to give them respect, and they buried them with armor, or their swords, and... They were mostly free men, they weren't slaves like they're shown, portrayed on TV. But one thing is when they test the bones, they actually found that they had more strontium than calcium. And that's a great indicator that what happened is they mostly ate rice and beans, so they were vegetarians. Uh, the earliest reliable evidence for vegan theory and practice in Greece dates back to the 6th century BC. The Orphis, a religious movement which abstained from dairy, eggs, and meat. The Bible itself tells us that the flood was brought on because of man's sinful desire, which all signs point to as eating flesh. Even the new uh, Noah movie uh, points this out and shows it. Noah was given permission by God to eat flesh during the time of the flood and after, but only from the clean animals that God permitted. Hence, when they were taken onto the boat, seven clean and two of the unclean were taken on at that time. And it was only for his generations because, as you would imagine, the flood would wipe away all plants from the earth. In the Bible, we find that the Jews, when leaving Egypt, had not a single sick or lame one among them. The book of Exodus tells us that there were 600,000 men on foot. That's besides women and children, plus many non-Israelites and livestock. So who knows how many there actually were. 
probably near 100,000 people. As the years went on, though, they started to crave meat, and they asked God uh, if they could eat fowl and, and air, birds. Eventually, they just started doing it, and that's when they began to get sick. Uh, God gave them manna as a vegan source of food that they could live on and be healthy, but it was when these cravings of flesh that they just desired because of their taste buds entered into their diet that disease and sickness manifested. In the book of Enoch, a one that's been removed from the Bible, it describes the fall of man which brought about the flood. It says in 1 Enoch chapter 7 verse 5, And they began to sin against the birds and the beasts and the reptiles and the fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. How can one sin against the birds, beasts, and reptiles and fish or each other? Well, by killing each other, of course. A lot of people think John the Baptist ran around eating locusts, the bug, but that was a translation error. It was actually the locust bean, or carapod, known today. John was an Essene Nazarene, the same as the Messiah, and they were 100% vegetarians, without question. So there is no possibility that John ran around eating bugs for food. That's nonsense. In the book of Acts, we have Peter, who saw a vision of a four-cornered sheep being let down out of heaven. Inside of it contained all of the beast of the earth and the fowl of the air and fish of the sea and insect on the ground. And a loud voice called down to Peter and said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, Surely not, Lord, for nothing has ever entered my mouth that is unpure or unclean. This happened three times before the sheet was taken up into heaven. As Peter sat, pondering what this vision was about, I caught the point God was trying to make about food. I would like you to notice that he never gave in, even though God was directly telling him what to do. He refused. Why? Because he knew from the teachings of his Messiah that it was wrong to kill and eat these things. That is why he told God directly, for nothing has ever entered my mouth that is unpure or unclean. And he did this in direct disobedience to God. Of course this vision only had to do with the Gentiles, but that is irrelevant because the fact remains that Peter knew what was wrong and right to eat. And he himself, like the other apostles, learned to be vegetarian. For he knew deep down that God would never tell him to do something which he despises. Peter knew that this was a test. What does the Bible tell us about our body? Well, did you know that it tells us that in the Book of Life that our body is written in it? Did you know it actually describes it? It's the temple that God gave us. In Psalms it says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. And in thy book all members were written. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. In reference to God it says that you made all the delicate parts of the inner workings of my body. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. Imagine for just a moment if Sarah had not kept her body clean and healthy. She would have not been able to bear a child in her advanced age. Jesus gave major consideration to the body when he came in the flesh to present himself as a living sacrifice worthy to his Father. He lived as a reflection of what we should be doing in our life. I don't tell you these things for any other reason except for I want you to have health and vitality like I myself have. And there is no better way of doing that than by living it. I have done this myself. This is why I'm recommending it. Every action has a consequence, and we reap what we sow. When the results line up in the mirror with what you want, you know you are doing something right. My friends are the epitome of this. For their age, they look phenomenal. I follow the program that's laid out in the book of Genesis, what we were designed to eat. That is fruits and berries, nuts and seeds, melons and roots. I find these are the most optimal for the human body and for longevity. I have been doing this since 2002 and I do not supplement and my blood and health are perfect. Aren't we obligated to God to keep our bodies healthy, creating and building a body that's clean, pure, and healthy? Isn't that what God wants for us? 
wouldn't that show God that he can trust us with this temple and free gift of life that he has given us? It tells us directly, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is truly one of the ways to worship him. Scripture even tells us, whoever is good has regard for the life of the beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. It also tells us in Isaiah that the one who slaughters an ox is the same that killeth a man. So I should be careful about slaughtering animals just to eat them. Remember, our dominion over them was for servitude, not flavor. Many Christians today think that if you're spiritual enough, it doesn't matter what you do to the body. That is the lie from the devil, who wants you to die and be riddled with sickness and disease. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the devil knows that if he can get you to wreck it, he will win, because the odds of you cursing God for, and blaming him for it are very high. The book of Revelation calls this the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, that the spirit and body are not connected. So you just serve and love God in spirit, and it doesn't matter what you do with your body, and it doesn't matter what you eat, but that is a lie. God shall not be mocked. What you sow, you shall reap. God did not make you addicted to drugs. He does not make you sick. That is on us. The devil knows that if he can ruin this generation with sickness and disease, get them to believe in evolution that they are nothing more but an ape, and that life is pointless and meaningless, and that we just exist by mere chance and luck, then these people will be empty inside and they will get hooked on drugs and medication and alcohol to care for about their selfish desires, focusing on material things, striving for money and power, fame and fun. They will seek worldly desires to fill a void, looking for someone or something to fill it to no avail. Eventually he will have them depressed, empty, suicidal, with no love for one another, themselves or God. I brought this up earlier, but I really need to reiterate it. Leviticus 3.17 states that an everlasting ordinance to all men forever to obey, no matter where you live. It states directly, you must never eat any fat or blood. This is a permanent law for you. It must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. It can't be more clear than that, and it's impossible to remove all blood from flesh foods. So therefore, all meat should remove based on science and logic. Since God is unchanging, and we know he has not changed his mind on that, he may allow us to do it, but it is, doesn't change the fact that he is disgusted by it. And we should want to do what makes our Father in Heaven happy. Think about it. You have a child, and he walks over and picks up a spider and decides to eat it. Would you be disgusted by this, or would you just let him? Obviously, you would tell your child, do what you want, but I wouldn't recommend that. Look, sin is in the world today because somebody ate what they were not supposed to eat. So nobody can tell me that food does not matter. It surely does. Also remember, in the next life there shall be no more death. The lion will lay next to the lamb, and so will we be fruitarian yet once again. Revelation tells us that we shall eat from the tree of life which bears twelve fruit for each season. 1 Corinthians also tells us, so whatsoever you eat, and whatever you drink, and whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. The story about being young at heart for most of us reaching the age of 72 means taking it easy a little bit, time to relax, maybe a light workout here and there. That's not the way this 72-year-old California man lives. This guy is Jim Morris. He has been bodybuilding for close to half a decade, and he shows no signs of slowing down. Now, he was a former Mr. America. Get this, at the age of 72, he works out every single day for an hour, six days a week. And here's his diet. Nuts, beans, fruits, and vegetables. Nuts, beans, fruits, and vegetables. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. No, no. <laughs> a side of cheesecake and uh, yeah, I didn't a big Yeah, a cheeseburger steak. in the mix. Yeah, Not at all. Yeah. 72 is looking good. He looks great. Don't He's wanna... so cute. <laughs> mutation rates. The mutation rate per generation is an observable fact. This is not open for debate. In humans, the rate is anywhere between 63.2 and 238 new mutations per generation. The factors that make the largest impact on mutation inheritance are the age of the parents. The older the parents, the more mutations get passed down to offspring. The mutation rate of 63 comes from a Greenland Trio study of 78 Icelandic parents. 
they discovered that parental mutations are doubling every 16.5 years, meaning that if you wait till you're 36 before you have your first child, you will have accumulated double the mutations from when you were 20, which have the potential to be passed on to your offspring. This occurs because three-fourths of the human germline mutation are paternal in origin, and their total number increases with a father's age at conception. Regardless, the clock is constant and consistent. Thus, it becomes a great tool for making testable and falsifiable predictions with, and this is exactly what young earth creationist Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has done. He has multiple mitochondrial DNA rate predictions, all of which have been validated. It is logical to conclude then that going back in time, in reverse, you end at a point where there are no mutations. Zero. Which begins with Biblical Adam and Eve. And guess what? The first study results ever done in 1997 confirmed this, and they obtained a time of 6,500 years ago for mitochondrial Eve, using the observable rates. That's only 327 generations ago. And this was secular scientists that discovered this, not creationists. Then, using creationist methods, we assumed that Adam and Eve lived around 300 generations ago. If this was true, then, using 63.2 mutations per generation, the lowest end of the spectrum for evolutionary benefits, the average human then should have 18,000 mutations built up, if this was correct. Well, guess what? Results confirmed 18,900 mutations on average, confirming Y chromosome Adam could not have lived more than 345 generations ago. So again, this compounding mutation rate is not a guess, it's a fact. This is obvious to anyone who studies biology because this is exactly how they create molecular clocks in the first place. So to think mutations are not compounding in all life is just nonsensical and flat out wrong. The inherited mutation accumulation happens to every species on Earth, and it's how we create these clocks. We are able to see the inherited mutational load per generation accumulating in all species we have ever tested. The fact of the matter is, those species may have different rates by which these clocks tick, based on a variety of factors like lifespan, reproduction age, etc. All of the results undermine the evolutionary timeline and theory of old age, as all of the observational rates are an order of magnitude higher than their assumption-based phylogenetic methods. Some are even up to 100 times faster. So, when we count up these de novo germline mutations, the numbers do not look good for evolution in any way. Not only this, many people still are under the impression that these de novo mutations are neutral and have no effect on the system whatsoever, but they couldn't be more wrong. They just don't get noticed by the system, so they are not selected for and removed. Thus, they build up, and we are able to make these clocks. But when you investigate many of these de novo mutations, they cause disease. So they are not neutral. They are near neutral, having small, slightly deleterious effects that the body cannot remove them because it cannot see them. And this is the problem for humans and all life on Earth that we have to deal with. God created man to live forever. It was Adam's sin that brought death into the world. God told Adam, because of you, the earth is cursed. From that time forward, lifespan has been decreasing. Were the ages allegorical? No. Could the ages have been lunar months? No, because the patriarchs would have been having children like Kenan, which would have placed them at less than six years old, Seth at eight years old, Enoch at five. So obviously the lunar months are not realistic. The extreme ages of the years and the people in the Bible, like the Ten Patriarchs, aren't just about them. They're actually mentioned throughout the Bible, where it shows that man life diminishes to his lowly place of a hundred. Even the epic Persian called the Book of Kings lists the similar ages, up to a thousand years. You find these in Greece, China, India, Vietnam, South America, and Japan. Significant research was done on the matter of these chronological genealogies, which concluded that they line up to the calendars of many traditions and cultures worldwide. 
So we're pretty confident that the actual years and the calendars of the ancient Hebrew sects reflect this, including others. Jewish people believe that they were literal. It's in their language, it's their scriptures, they wrote it. So we presume that they understood their own language. So with different environmental conditions, such as more pressure, which has been shown to increase lifespan, fruit flies in the hyperbaric biospheres in Texas live 10 times longer than normal just by increasing air pressure. With more magnetism in the past, we have been shown that increasing lifespan with just magnetism did something to the piranhas. They grew up to four times larger and grew twice as long. The stronger ozone layer in the past that protects us from ultraviolet radiation, which would increase lifespan and health as well, while at the same time discovering that early Earth was actually like a Garden of Eden. We also have evidence from hyperbaric chambers, which are wonderful tools for testing. So far, we have made huge dragonflies and many other creatures, but they were testing mostly for size. But what they found out is that life expectancy went up in every single case. Since they were either replicating one or more of the aspects of ancient Earth, then we know by empirical evidence that life extension just from living back then was possible. And yes, this Sovin and Neanderthal were totally human. Studies have shown that 95% of their DNA is identical to present day humans. And Neanderthal DNA appears to fall with inside the variation of present day humans. I know they portrayed Neanderthal as a hunched over hairy ape man, but this is not the case as Neanderthal actually had less body hair than present day humans. For example, this is due to a genetic marker called RS4849721. They are both shared by us and them, no surprise there. Here's an instrument they made, so they were making instruments and playing music, which no primate does. We know that ancient man was physically superior as well. They had larger brains, and we know today that larger brains correlate to longer lifespan. And we go back in time, as you can see, the physically superior they get. Scientists wanted to compare the Neanderthal genome to see how different they actually were. So they picked a random Neanderthal from the GenBank NC01137. The findings were shocking that Neanderthal had far less mutations than people today. This is what would be expected with creationism, with our model, if ancient man was superior than modern day man. Neanderthal children had no brow ridges. These brow ridges grew very slowly over time throughout their life. Even Neanderthal teens still had no brow ridges. So we know observationally they were extremely aged people, just like our model says. Neanderthal teeth have also been investigated and there are more good evidence because they have high fractal enamel repair systems, including enamel regeneration inside their teeth, called pellicle, allowing their teeth to heal, unlike humans today. Here's the jaw of a 13 year old kid from the 1960s. Research concluded that the jaw turned out to be the equivalent of a today's child of nine years old, meaning that a child in the late 1600s did in 13 years what it only takes nine years today to accomplish for a child. This is more proof that we were slower developing in the past. Now, with no one alive right now at the age of 500, how can I make the argument that in the past that they did? Well, this is easy. I can answer this with a question. Can man today live to 900? Well, the answer is yes. Oh, here's a gerontologist by the name of Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's a pioneer in anti-aging, a biologist and biomedical gerontologist who works for the Sense Foundation, trying to discover a cure for aging once and for all. This isn't science fiction. It's on the horizon for all of us. This is what transhumanism movement is all about. It's about using science and technology like gene editing software, CRISPR-Cas9, to tap into our genetic activation dormant longevity genes so we can switch them on and live forever. So if man today has the potential to live for a thousand years, why couldn't physically and genetically superior ancient man living in these far better environmental conditions with better foods, fewer diseases, live for that amount of time? Logically, we could. But heavy bombardment can come from tobacco smoke, harmful food additives, radon gas, chemicals, and a lot of ultraviolet radiation. The MTHFR gene mutation function is actually broken anywhere from 20 to 70% in all people on Earth today. This matters because it's a master gene regulator. It controls how well other genes work. So the worse it gets, the worse others get. 
For example, here's the Dickinson children, dubbed the Methuselah children. They were kept prisoner by their mother in an attic for their entire childhood, never allowed outside to play even once. So they never were exposed to the damage of the sun's radiation, which causes what? You guessed it, more harmful mutations and faster aging. Here are the kids at 15, 13, and 18 years old. As you can see, their age is very, very slow. Another good example is Jeannie Wiley. Her entire life, she was actually chained to a toilet because of her incontinence and her dad thought she was retarded so he didn't want anything to do with her so he locked her in her room. Here she is at 19 years old. She was never exposed to the sun's radiation. She also stopped aging. Here's a retired truck driver. The left side of his face exposed to the sun as he drove his entire career. Here are identical twin sisters. One worked outside, the other worked inside. Here are two twins. One is a smoker, high mutational load, the other is not. Stacked with this and the fact that humans add 64 mutations every single generation, we have a problem. We also have aging diseases today. Here's Warner syndrome and here's progeria. These diseases are proven that they link genes to aging. Next, we have our biblical creation model, which lines up with the evidence of early earth was being more conducive to living longer and preventing ultraviolet damage today. So this stacked with the genetic factors that allow man to live much larger. Our original diet and how man ate compared to now is also very different. Today, people eat almost anything and cook nearly all of their foods. The the Pottinger cat study proved without question that the harm that this does to a population over time. We humans are no different. We were created to eat a certain way and no one does this anymore. With a generation after generation of doing everything wrong, we see what we see in the world today. This is evidence uh, is topped with the fact that we know heirloom wild fresh foods are healthier and superior for health than today's high sugar content hybrids grown for our current sugar craving population that are picked early and sit on grocery store shelves for who knows how long. Most people don't even eat vegetables or fruit. So also, considering that nearly everybody has their longevity genes turned off in people permanently today from mutations or, or wrong SNP attachment to the gene, we have identified over 16 specific genes correlated with aging. So the best question should be, if man can now live to be a thousand by turning back all on these dormant genes, why couldn't man in the past who had these genes be already functioning and have less total mutation buildup not live so long? It seems logical based on the evidence that these mutations build up and the gene, that the genome is crumbling. So with more pure genetics, this longevity would have been normal. So we believe that, and also know that magnetism makes things live longer, pressure makes things live longer, we know that diet makes things live longer, we know that fewer mutations mean less disease, we know that stronger genetics makes things live longer, then why is it uh, impossible to think then that all of those things put together, man couldn't live much longer? I think it's crazy to assume that they didn't. So I would love to know why a gerontologist, geneticist, a specialist in the field of aging, who all say that inside of us is the capacity to live like the people lived in the Bible, so if the biological evidence is inside of us and the scientific evidence shows that man has the ability to live to extreme ages currently so if we have this potential inside of us right now locked away then it's pretty strong evidence that ancient man was far superior in the past either way mankind could have reached these extreme numbers like the ancient text talked about now we do find evidence for these extreme ages when we test their bones for example neanderthals that were found in spain had far better and longer lives than those that were found in the north that lived in extreme cold regions of the world they became inbred and cannibal but all of the bones found in spain were saturated in strontium meaning they were plant eaters they had large and thick skulls and their dental examinations proved that they were extremely aged human beings this can be denied or rationalized away but the fact is I think that humans lived for a very, very long time, and we do have evidence to back this up. Or you can just continue to believe those who are not experts in aging, but have guessed or estimated ages based on their own personal interpretation of the evidence, based on their own uniformitarian belief that they were indoctrinated to believe. And they use biased assumptions when calibrating all molecular clocks. The theory of evolution is the only theory that is protected by law. It is not open to criticism and has removed all variants to be falsified and removed as a theory.